Okay, hello everyone, uh, friends and colleagues. Welcome to this uh, very interesting dialogue ahead of us called New Developments to the International Anti-Corruption Court. A subject which is being spoken about more and more at every corner of the world and very much so at international platforms. And today we are really very, very fortunate to have very um, critical and core legal minds behind the entire establishment of this idea and to actually listen to some ideas and some very, very uh, interesting developments that have taken place that are going to also take place at the end of this month uh, over the International Criminal Court. We've heard so much about grand corruption, about transnational corruption, uh, eating away at the lives of communities, people at every corner of the world. In my own country, we've just sent a kleptocrat to jail after years and years of perseverance. And we also know it's not a victimless crime. It's a crime that actually impacts on so many communities, a crime that affects development, climate crisis, international financial flows and the economy, et cetera. And most of all, it also impacts on the work of whistleblowers, investigative journalists, et cetera. So one very important point uh, that I keep reminding myself and that keeps um, emerging all the time is that kleptocrats enjoy so much impunity. Why? Because I think so clearly stated in the International Anti-Corruption Court uh, flyer, it actually says that they also control the administration of justice. And I think this is where we want to listen to the top legal minds to actually help us um, understand why there's a, a need in a forum maybe to effectively address prosecution, punish kleptocrats and all the transnational crime that's going on, how to get ahead of the whole thing. So in order to uh, make the most of the one and a half hours, I am actually going to um, ask Matthias, the managing director of the ANCA coalition to say a few words. But before that, I also wanted to say that uh, as part of the coordination committee of the International Anti-Corruption Court, I actually had the privilege of uh, um, knowing and listening to some of these top legal minds and also trying to actually get very difficult countries like mine in Malaysia and other developing nations to also get plugged in on the conversations and narratives. And I'm hoping that civil society organizations in these countries would also pick up uh, the momentum and try to bring it to national level conversations. So there's just so much to learn from today, but I'm gonna ask Matthias to spend the next three minutes on an opening uh, address and remarks and why we're doing this as the UNCAC coalition and engaging the III on this uh, very important subject matter. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this very interesting uh, session. I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, three brilliant legal minds who will be introduced to uh, you just in a moment and to discuss uh, with you uh, to hear about the idea of, of an international anti-corruption court, what is happening here, and to discuss with you um, how could it work in practice, what are the concerns, why do we need such a court? Um, I think this is the first uh, open discussion we're having as the UNCAC coalition with, with the whole membership uh, being able to join the discussion. And, and I've seen that there is a lot of interest on the topic from our community, from our membership. As the UNCAC coalition, we don't have a clear position on whether as a co global coalition, we support uh, the court. Uh, we haven't put a lot of resources behind uh, supporting the campaign. Um, so for us uh, as a global coalition, I think this is a brilliant opportunity to, to, uh, to advance the discussion, to reflect uh, about it, to hear more about it, and to possibly eventually down the road uh, develop uh, our own uh, position on that. Um, in any case, uh, Integrity Initiatives International, the initiative uh, driving really the discussion um, is, is going to join the UNCAC coalition uh, soon as a member, uh, which, which I, I look forward to. And uh, yeah, I would encourage all of you to use this opportunity, uh, this access 
to three highly respected and established uh, uh, legal uh, minds to uh, raise your questions and to uh, to uh, have an interesting and engaging discussion. So um, this is a special session of the UNCA Coalition's Working Group on Grant Corruption and uh, State Capture. Uh, and uh, Cynthia, who just uh, introduced the session, is one of the co-chairs. The other one is Gillian Dell, who will moderate the session. So I'm uh, back to you, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Matthias. Uh, good evening, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Cynthia Gabriel from Malaysia, co-chair of the Working Group on Grand Corruption and State Capture. So together with my uh, colleague and co-chair, uh, Ms. Jillian Dell, we are going to actually spend the next uh, 90 minutes, the next one and a half hours, listening to three most esteemed speakers. And I have the privilege to actually introduce the three speakers. Uh, the first is Justice Richard Goldstone from South Africa. He is the former Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, first prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals to the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, chair of the Independent Expert Review of the International Criminal Court and vice chair of Integrity Initiatives International. The next, speaker is Justice Maria Wilson, Justice of Appeal of the Supreme Court of the Trinidad and Tobago, former trial lawyer at the International Criminal Court and at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and former Assistant Director of Public Prosecution in Trinidad and Tobago. And the third speaker, is Mr. Alan Rock from Canada, uh, President Emeritus and Professor of Law at the University of Ottawa, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and former Canadian Ambassador to the United Nations. You can't have a panel any higher than this. And we're so fortunate this evening to actually have the three of them speak to us and that we have more than 140 registrants already uh, registered to hear your very, very esteemed opinions. And I now hand over the moderation and the event to my colleague, Julian Dell, to actually uh, take us through the next uh, steps of this conversation. Over to you, Julian. Thanks, Cynthia, and thanks, Matthias, for the introductory words. Um, hello, all. I'm uh, Gillian Dell. I work at um, the Transparency International Secretariat in Berlin and am co-chair of the UNCAC Coalition, as well as the Coalition <coughs> Grand Corruption and State Capture Working Group. I'd like to add my welcome to our distinguished panelists and to you all. Um, and I'll just say a brief word about the run of the meeting. Um, for about 25 minutes, our panelists will speak to us about the proposal for an international anti-corruption court. And then at 14.30 or 2.30, we'll start, uh, that's a um, Central European time, uh, we'll start taking a round of questions for the panel. And then we'll turn to comments from the floor about the proposals you'll be hearing about. So let's um, start hearing from our um, panel. Over to you, Justice Goldstone. We're very much looking forward to hearing from you. Well, th th thank you very much indeed, Gillian. And on behalf of Integrity Initiatives International, III, I would like to warmly thank the, the, the UNCAC Coalition uh, for for arranging this th this particular webinar and giving 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 my colleagues and me the opportunity uh, to 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 address your members on on the uh, campaign to establish an international anti-corruption court. I need hardly tell this audience about the billions of United States dollars that are stolen annually by corrupt officials. More than ten times the grants made to developing countries is lost through corruption. Corruption is a major barrier to the success of the uh, UN Strategic Development Goals. 
that imperils efforts to stem and protect those who are victims of pandemics and epidemics. Corruption inhibits the promotion of democracy and in some cases threatens the promotion of international peace and security. It inhibits action to counter climate change. I doubt if there's a single country in the world that has been immune from the corrupt benefit for money set aside by governments to fight the coronavirus pandemic. And there's no shortage of domestic laws. There are 189 members of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC. The convention requires the criminalization in each of the member countries of bribery of public officials, the embezzlement and misappropriation of public funds, money laundering and obstruction of justice. You know it well. The problem, which you also must realize, is lack of enforcement of those laws and democracies where law enforcement, including the courts, has been captured by the kleptocrats. The spoils of kleptocracy are laundered in many countries around the world. It is placed in anonymous accounts in foreign banks, substantial amounts are put into investments, and especially fixed property, all invariably owned by shell companies. The facilitators include banks, lawyers, estate agents, and others, both in the kleptocrat state and in the state or states money is laundered. What is missing is an international mechanism to investigate and prosecute kleptocrats and those who facilitate their crimes. The domestic systems are unable or unwilling to do so themselves. The IACC would provide a forum to fairly and effectively prosecute and punish kleptocrats and their facilitators. Such an international court would be complementary to domestic courts. In some cases, developing countries do not have the means or the resources to fight grand corruption. They might well approach the IACC to do so on their behalf. That was the experience of the ICC when some African countries requested the court to launch investigations into international crimes committed in their own countries. If countries where monies are laundered join the court, and that is likely, the court could freeze the ill-gotten assets and at an appropriate time restore those funds to the countries that are victim to kleptocracy. The IACC could make its investigators, prosecutors and judges available to offer valuable assistance to their counterparts in countries that are striving to improve their anti-corruption capacity. A key feature of the IACC will be its power to freeze and recoup the ill-gotten gains in the jurisdiction of states' parties. It will be essential for the countries that attract those funds to join the court. I have in mind countries such as Switzerland, Singapore, the United Kingdom, and many others, where billions of dollars worth of stolen assets have been laundered. It will be in their interests and those of the victim nations to have those funds repatriated or repurposed. Finally, I would point out that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is not able itself to become involved in investigating or prosecuting the corrupt. Its statute does not encompass financial crimes. To amend that statute requires the support of some seven-eighths of its 123 members, a bar unlikely to be crossed. Even if that were to happen, an ICC prosecutor whose resources are severely limited would be unlikely to go after the corrupt rather than those accused of atrocity crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity. It is far more relevant to establish a new specialized court, slim and efficient, and staffed by experts in the field of corruption. The campaign for an ICC is now supported by the governments of the Netherlands, Canada, and Ecuador. They have invited over 50 governments to attend a ministerial level round table to be held in The Hague in 10 days from now. IIII has been requested over the coming months to prepare a draft statute for the IACC. I'm happy to say that, that I'm, I'm happy that we're joined by Justice Wilson and Ambassador Rock, who are members of the IIII IACC Treaty Committee. Thank you very much, Gillian, for inviting us. Many thanks, Justice Goldstone. Um, I think that was a very concise and clear a uh, set of comments highlighting the reasons mo motivating the proposal for the court, the harm from grand corruption, the lack of enforcement, the involvement of international facilitators, the ill-gotten gains around the world, and why a, a, a specialized international anti-corruption court could play a, 
a role. Um, let me turn now to Justice Wilson. Justice Wilson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jillian. I feel very privileged to be invited to this, um, this morning's proceedings. I feel very passionate about the formation of this International Anti-Criminal Anti-Corruption Court. And that, that comes from my experience because I was once a prosecutor and involved in a corruption case. And would you believe 21 years later, that case is still going on. So my passion comes partly from that. Now, as a member of the, I'm a member of the treaty committee, as Justice Goldstone has indicated. And that treaty committee consists of some 12 to 13 persons. And our function really is to give some guidance and direction to, in relation to the, the, the formation of the statute, the contents of the statute. And, and when we do this, we then have another committee, which is the drafting committee, which will further research the issues and then draft. Additionally, we have an advisory committee and they would provide advice to us and whatever is drafted will come back again to us, the treaty committee, so that we could comment and see if, it, if we're satisfied with the contents of the drafting committee. So that is, that is the work we do in the treaty committee. Now, this court, an international anti-corruption court, Justice Goldson has referred to quite a lot what it will be like, but the whole idea of this court is to be a court of last resort. We have incorporated the concept of complementarity, which the Rome Statute refers to, which, which in essence says that it's only when state parties are unwilling or unable to prosecute, investigate and or prosecute the applicable crimes, will, they, will this court um, have jurisdiction? So that's, that's an important concept, the concept of complementarity. So we recognize the sovereignty, sovereignty of states and only as a last resort will the International Anti-Corruption Court have jurisdiction. Now, you are probably wondering like what would be the applicable um, law that we will in fact um, include? Well, we intend to give integrity to the domestic laws which state parties have had to enact who are parties to the ONCAC. And that would be criminalizing the bribery of public officials, embezzlement, misappropriation of public funds, and also money laundering. Those are some of the offenses that we are considering. So we feel that ONCAC has done such great work in, in getting and assisting countries to incorporate certain offenses that we hope to build on the work that you have done and incorporate your offenses as, the, as part of the applicable offenses that the court will be concerned with. Now, we expect that the International Anti-Corruption Court would be a forum to fairly and effectively prosecute and punish kleptocrats and persons who enable them to create, to, to commit corruption crimes. Um, we hope that the court will be a, a deterrence to uh, corruption by leaders of countries. And like the ONCAC, part of the courts, the concept of the court is to recover, repatriate, rep portrait and repurpose stolen um, assets for the benefit of victims of grand corruption through orders of restitution, for example. And we also hope to make expert investigators, prosecutors and judges available to offer valuable advice and assistance to counterparts in different countries. So we see that we can build on the work that you have done and to, to deal with the gap in the international legal framework, we see that there's a gap because there is no 
international court in existence to, act, to actually prosecute kleptocrats when their countries are unwilling and a, unable to do that for one reason or another. Um, how do we see this working? Well, we don't have to have a large number of state parties, but once we have a sufficient number and those parties, uh, parties, countries with financial centers, which are used by kleptocrats to hide their money, then these countries could in fact assist the court. I'll explain it to you how, I, how we see it working. So, so for example, if there's a kleptocrat in country A, but that country A is not a state party to the IACC, but he uses, he sends his funds to country B, and country B is in fact a state party of the IACC, then the court will have, and that, that kleptocrat goes to that country B, then the court will have jurisdiction over the, that national because even though his state is not a state party, because he used another country's financial system to in fact commit the crime and that country is a state party. So that's some of the ways we, we see it working. And we see that such a court would be a great deterrent to would be corrupt national leaders. And that's why we highly recommend it since there's no other court in existence. So that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justice Wilson. Um, I think you explained very well the drafting process for the statute and the nature of the court, in particular that it will be a court of last resort with complementary jurisdiction, that it will use domestic law and that it can have a role in recovering and returning stolen assets and otherwise filling gaps in the international legal framework. So now over to former Minister of Justice, Alan Rock. You have the floor. Good morning, thank, thank you, Jillian. And may I say that my colleagues and I are simply delighted to have this opportunity to address the members of the coalition um, who will have a crucial uh, role in the increasingly broad international discussion of, of how to deal with grand corruption and the role that an international anti-corruption court can play in that global effort. Um, in my a few moments, I'd like to speak about the, the process which has been initiated by Canada and others uh, toward um, a, a more structured discussion of, of anti-corruption. Um, Canada has been engaged in the, in the process of looking at its own laws in relation to corruption and money laundering. We have found that in many ways they fall short and require uh, revision. They also require more vigilant enforcement. But as part of all that, we've been increasingly aware that uh, corruption is a transnational phenomenon which cannot be addressed by one country alone. And the idea of uh, an international court to deal with grand corruption has been uh, increasingly the subject of, of discussion at political levels here in Canada. That culminated in the last federal election we had a year ago, in which both major parties included in their platforms for the election, a commitment to uh, have Canada lead the charge in terms of the creation of the International Anti-Corruption Court. And so um, following the election, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, included in his mandate letter to the Minister of Global Affairs, um, the responsibility of taking that leadership role and seeing to uh, doing everything possible toward the creation of an international anti-corruption court. Canada quickly made common cause with other countries who've made a similar commitment. Um, and Netherlands was at the top of that list. Uh, Netherlands has also formally committed itself as a matter of policy toward the creation of the international anti-corruption court. And uh, Canada and the Netherlands invited Ecuador to join them in a tripartite group that would organize an international high-level roundtable 
to speak about uh, how we're going to collectively deal with grand corruption and more specifically, the role that an IACC could play in that process. And so Canada, Netherlands and Ecuador are co-chairing a high level roundtable, which is going to take place the 27th and 28th of November in The Hague. And uh, those three countries have invited uh, over 50 other uh, UN member states to join them in that, in that discussion. And we expect that many of those uh, states will send representatives to the, to the high level discussion. Um, the, uh, the three of countries have already circulated a concept note for the meeting. Uh, they have uh, circulated a draft ministerial statement, which they hope to have the first uh, outcome document from the roundtable. The ministerial statement will be at the level of principles, uh, hopefully uniting all of the participants in a, a collective and unanimous statement of shared resolve to do whatever can practically be done to address grand corruption and the appalling toll that it takes internationally on the achievement of our goals, as Justice Goldstone has, has mentioned in his remarks. Apart from the ministerial statement, uh, the participants at the high level roundtable also intend to issue uh, a summary of their findings and recommendations um, drawn from the very rich discussion they will no doubt have, uh, revealing regional perspectives around the world, uh, as well as a shared, uh, sharing uh, best practices and the fruits of their endeavors to date. There may also be a, a third document dealing specifically with the IACC that is yet to be uh, determined. The point here is that Canada, the Netherlands and Ecuador wish to add some structure to what has been until now uh, a, a general aspiration to do something collectively and effectively about grand corruption. Um, the, the ministerial statement and the other documents that emerge from the round table will be presented uh, to the next session of the democracy summit to be convened next year by prime minister uh, by president biden of the united states uh, because of course corruption uh, poses such a threat to the quality of democracy uh, in uh, throughout the world so um that is where we stand. The, the drafting committee chaired by Justice Goldstone has prepared the frequently asked questions and answers for circulation to participants at the round table in The Hague, uh, addressing the most commonly asked questions and providing uh, basic information about how the court would function, what this jurisdiction would be, and uh, what its objectives would be once it's created. Um, as mentioned, we're also working away at the, the legal issues that arise when you come to draft the actual treaty. Uh, how should the treaty be framed? Um, what law will the court uh, apply? Um, how will complementarity function as a practical matter? All of those issues to be addressed. So this uh, process is moving forward uh, quickly. We're all very encouraged by um, the developments in recent months and particularly uh, the possibilities that arise from the high level round table later this month. And we look forward to the uh, ministerial statement and other documents that will emerge from that round table. But um, this morning, we look forward to questions and comments from members of the coalition. We're very interested in your uh, reactions to what's been said here so far. We're delighted to take questions you may have and to engage with you fully in a discussion of a subject which we know is a priority for you as well as for us. So thank you, Gillian, and uh, the membership for this opportunity this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Rock, um, for the explanations about Canada's role in the court initiative, um, the tripartite group, also about the upcoming high level round table in The Hague on the 28th to 29th of November, the expected statement of principles and other documents, and the general idea of adding more structure to this discussion about a court. Um, with that, we will, um, and thank you um, to all our three 
uh, distinguished panel panelists uh, for joining us and for these observations and explanations. And I might add for keeping very correctly to the, to the time allocated. So um, we're now coming to a key part of the meeting uh, and that's the section for um, questions and comments. And um, I'd like to do that start by opening the floor to the participants for a round of questions, first of all, before the comments. So that will be questions to the panel. And then we'll ask the panel uh, to uh, make brief, uh, brief responses to those questions. I have a few questions myself, but I think I'd rather uh, give our uh, participants in this meeting an opportunity. So if you have a question, please um, raise, raise your hand uh, and, um, also, and when you're called on, please state your name and organization and please keep your questions and subsequently your comments brief so that many participants have an opportunity. So let's have a look at whether we have yet raised hands. I see one there from Matthias. Um, while we, and we'll, we'll call on Matthias while we're waiting. Um, perhaps also a bit, given the number of participants, Bettina, you can help me to um, collect questions. But let's start with um, Matthias's question. Thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentations. And I would like to break the ice by uh, maybe asking a question that, that we hear from our membership uh, sometimes. So if an organization, a national NGO, for example, thinks this is a, a, a cause they would like to support or at least learn more about in a first step, would you have any uh, suggested readings for, for activists who want to uh, join the discussion? And are at this point, are there any entry points for uh, organizations that would like to support the idea um, to become involved? Uh, is there anything that, do you, that you would like to uh, civil society groups to do to help produce or, 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 or advance the momentum of the discussions? Thank you. Thanks, well, Matthias. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, sorry, Julian. No, um, well, you, you could go ahead and answer what, what I'd like to, um, after you've answered that, I'd like to collect about three questions, but but why don't you go ahead and um, answer that while we're collecting questions. Thanks. Right. Well, 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 thank you very much, Matthias, for that, that, that important question. Uh, I, I can hardly exaggerate the importance of a civil society when it comes to the and the success of, of international courts, civil and criminal. I know from my experience in the Yugoslavian Rwanda yeah. tribunals, the, 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 the huge input and, 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 and the developments that, 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 that came as a response to, to pressure from civil society. So, so we, we would welcome the, the, the input from civil society. And, and, and as far as uh, readings are concerned, uh, I, I can only suggest that you should uh, have a look at the website of Integrity Initiatives International I will ask Marquis to, 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 to just in, in the chat column to, 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 to give you the, uh, the, the, the website of, of III, and you will find there in particular, I'd recommend a, 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 an essay uh, that was recently published by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Be, before I stop, let me say it, it's also considered very important by III that, that an international anti-corruption court should be the result of pressure from all over the world north and south, east and west. This, this, this certainly shouldn't be a western or northern uh, uh, initiative. It's very important that we get Asian and African and Latin American uh, 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 governments and civil societies involved with us. Thank you. 